uh, as an intro and then we're going to actually look at the system. So um, we are Artifactual Systems. We are the lead developers of Archivematica and a system called Access to Memory. The way that we consider each of these systems is that they should work in tandem in order to accomplish all of your archives and digital preservation needs and provide access to your content over time. Um, our company, Artifactual, that's based in Canada, it consists of archivists, librarians, and also technologists who do our development. But all of that development is guided by archives and library expertise. Uh, we also, as some of you may know, we work with museums. So quickly, Adam, which again, that's the access component to Archivematica, provides public access and content manage management over time. It manages accessions, taxonomies, multiple repositories, restrictions and rights, and also authority records. Um, it allows you to have access derivatives that you may or may not have created using Archivematica, including streaming video. It has multilingual description and ISAG, RAD, DAX, EAD export, and some mods. It also links to your preserved archival packages and syncs some of your metadata that you create in Archivematica. So Archivematica that we're here to talk about today is free and open source digital preservation. Um, the license is AGPL version 3, so everything we do is free and open. You just have to attribute it. Um, and we look forward to having community development adding to our work over time. Right now, however, Artifactual is the lead developer. Um, Archivematica is run on best practices and standards. There's no barrier to user groups for Archivematica to be a part of the community or to read any of the documentation that you need to both develop our software further and to use our software. Um, we have consistent system independent archival information packages, AIPs. If you're familiar with OAIS, it is the standard on which Archivematica has been built. And that's where we get the term archival information packages. From here forward, I'll be referring to those as APES. <laughs> it's a shorter way to say it. Archivematica uses Bagit to package our APES. Bagit is a Library of Congress specification. We have simple Dublin core template in Archivematica, which I'll show you, that allows you to add some simple description to your package. We have METS, which is a METS XML that includes premise preservation um, restrictions and rights. And I'll show you the template for that as well. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about those archival information packages. The Archivematica archival information packages, APES, um, they go through a series, uh, your content, your digital content goes through a series of transformations in Archivematica. Um, we manage all of those transformations using something called microservices. I'll show you that in the dashboard when we have our demonstration. For now, though, I'll just highlight that we do integrity and virus checks, format identification, characterization, and metadata extraction, forensic activities, validation, arrangement, and transcription, for instance. So you'll see several of these microservices in the dashboard, and I'll talk with them a little bit about them a little bit more. We do normalization on ingest, so your digital content objects come in, and we keep the original, so we preserve the original file that you have. Um, but then we also do normalization, which is a migration to a sustainable format. Um, we have all the documentation behind why we've made decisions on which formats we do our migrations to, um, all on our website, which you'll get a link to at the end, but it's archivematica.org. Um, we, again, we bag the AIP in using Bagit, and we also zip it up, and you can control how much can, it's compressed before it goes into storage. It includes logs of everything that's happened while it's run through the Archivematica system, and it includes metadata in that METS XML. We'll take a closer look at that during the demonstration. Um, we, during the process in Archivematica, include or add metadata, including premise rights and restrictions. Again, I'll show you that template. And we are storage agnostic. So we've done a lot of integrations with different storage systems. Um, if any of you are following the Archivematica discussion list today that we announced Archives Direct, which allows for storage and hosting in DuraCloud, that's the most recent storage integration we've done. But in general, we're storage agnostic. So you're not actually storing your preserved materials in Archivematica. You're doing your archival processing in Archivematica and then storing them elsewhere and providing access using either access to memory or some other access system. 
So for those of you who are Doctor Who fans, um, the AIP, I like to say, is so much bigger on the inside, like the TARDIS. So it's a value add. Um, so instead of just storing your content objects, my apologies for that. <laughs> Um, instead of just storing your content objects, you're also storing all the metadata with them that contains information about their creation and all of the processes that you've gone through in Archivematica, all of the logs. Um, so you get all that rich context information about, um, about your digital objects over time, and so you can always revisit that. Um, you get information about the formats and the structure of your content, so how those directories are, were structured in Archivematica. And then this is all to protect against things like software obsolescence, which are so many things that are challenges to us in digital preservation. So we're looking here at the METS file. So this is the METS file in general. This is just a really quick look at it. You have a section for your descriptive metadata, that's simple Dublin core that you either create in Archivematica through a template or that you um, include with your contents. We have administrative metadata, so this brings in premise, preservation metadata about the object, so technical information about the digital objects, information about all of the events, so all of these microservices that occur in Archivematica, like any transformations we've made are recorded there. Agents, which include both the people who we're doing any transformations in Archivematica, as well as the systems and the open source tools which are doing these processes, and then premise rights and restrictions, and that's all in our administrative metadata section. Our file section is a list of all the files with their roles and relationships, and then the struct map is a representation of the physical structure of the AIP. So we've had several partners over time. This is actually a bit of an old slide. We've got several more that have just recently added. But these are the partners who have driven much of the development in Archivematica in that they've funded it and helped us um, through their actual content um, build our system based around real life use cases. So actual content that needs to be processed in Archivematica. Um, we've done several integrations, as I mentioned before, and I won't go through all of these, but if you have any questions, please do contribute them to the chat, and we'll try to talk about them in detail towards the end. Um, what I do want to say about the integrations is that we do our best to integrate at many different points in the process. So that is, for instance, um, we have one integration with DSpace that allows you to take content out of your DSpace and process it through Archivematica. And then we have other workflows that allow you, for instance, to integrate with something like Archivum on the other end, and Archivum is a storage structure. So um, we try to do integrations with lots of tools so that the resources that people have put into building up those resources in, or those tools in their own environment don't go to waste. And then we'll come back to this slide during question and answer, but just so you know, um, there is the Archivematica website, the Access to Memory website, and then any questions that you have that don't get answered today, um, you will be able to uh, ask to the Archivematica discussion list. So now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and do a demonstration. Give me one second. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and start the demonstration now. Um, so you should be seeing my Archivematica screen. Again, if you cannot see it for whatever reason, please do um, give me a quick chat message and let me know. Um, so just, you know, can't see your Archivematica screen. So you should see a mouse moving around. <laughs> so this is what we call the Archivematica dashboard. This runs in a browser. Um, in this case, I'm running it in Google Chrome browser. We find that it works best in Google Chrome and in Firefox. 
So um, I'll give you a quick tour. The Archivematica dashboard has what we call tabs. So when I refer to tabs, I'm talking about these across the top. Transfer, ingest, archival storage, preservation planning, access, and administration. And you'll see here I'm signed in as a user called Unicorn. That's my user. Um, we are right now in the transfer tab. I'm going to come back to this because this is when process, where processing starts. Um, but first, I want to jump over to the administration tab to show you one thing. Um, you have lots of configuration choices here, but in particular, I wanted to show you the processing configuration. What this does is it allows you to set points at which Archivematica stops and allows you to make a decision. So you can preset many of these, especially if you know your workflows really well. You can preset them so you can just go through the process um, without having to stop. But if you wanted to, you could uncheck everything here and make many choices through the course of running Archivematica. All right, I'm going to hop back over to preservation planning. Access is if you're using Atom. So if you are using Atom for access, then you have a link to your digital um, objects that are your access copies, what are called DIPs in OAIS. Um, the preservation planning tab here, this is called the Format Policy Registry. I won't go into this in detail. We will have a future webinar that goes into a lot of detail about all of the services that are controlled by the FPR and how you use those. You'll see here one important thing is this update button. This update allows you to get any new rules that we add to the Format Policy Registry server. And those can be rules for doing things like migration to preservation formats, um, the addition of new formats with new PUIDs from Pronom, um, the uh, addition of new tools to Archivematica, um, and then other tools to do things like transcription or um, extraction. So extraction, for example, is if you have zipped content, you might want to unpack that content and then run the objects through Archivematica. So I'm going to go back to transfer. And so what we're assuming now is that the user of Archivematica has set up Archivematica with some one or, or more locations locally or hosted somewhere that have content, um, any content that they need to run through Archivematica to be preserved. And once you've pre-configured those using the Archivematica storage service, um, then you'll see all of the locations that you've set up here. And so right now I just have one set up with our sample data, but there could be multiple locations here. And then what I would do is once I've chosen that location, I would browse within that location to a directory that contains objects for preservation. So you'll see that, for instance, if I expand some of these, I've got other directories, um, but I'm going to choose the top level here as my transfer content. Um, you can only drill down to directories. You cannot see objects here. So the assumption is that you are going to be doing work at the directory level. So again, I'm going to highlight here, I'm going to do my images, I'm going to click to add, and then you'll see that it shows up here in the Archivematica dashboard transfer tab. So I'm going to name my transfer. Um, I will just call this webinar in this case, if I can type. If I had an accession number, I could attach it here, um, but you don't have to include an accession number. And I'm going to go ahead and start the transfer. So once I begin, um, Archivematica is now copying the contents over to its processing servers. Um, you'll see it pop up here, and whenever you see a little bell icon, that means there's a decision to be made. So you see if I've lingered here, it says a waiting decision. Um, I'm going to select that I want to approve this transfer. That just means that I'm ready to start the processes in Archivematica and start going through our microservices. So all of these other ones that you see here are other samples that I've run through. If I click on any of these lines, I can see all of the microservices that ran on that content. And they stay in the dashboard until you decide to clear them out using this Remove button. Um, for now, I just wanted to expand these and show you that we see all the microservices that occurred for anything we ran through. And if we want to see more detail about any of these microservices, for instance, if we want to see more detail about characterize and extraction of metadata, we would expand that here and we could see details about what occurred. If there had been any errors, this top line for the microservice 
would be red and then everything below it these jobs um, you would see another red job and you'd be able to drill down all the way into a detailed output about that error so in this case of course there's not one but if there was an error you would see red here and it would all be shifted towards the top so this is the one we just started my um, webinar let's go through what's already happened some of these are just microservices that help Archivematica process the materials um, in its own servers. So we have to do some things like clean up and sanitize file names, but don't worry, even though we're cleaning up those file names, your Mets XML will contain the original file name, so you're never going to lose that. Um, we're also recording the structure of the transfer, so we have all of our original directory structures captured, um, so that's all going to be in your Mets. You'll see that we've renamed it with a UUID, that's a universal identifier. And so we've actually assigned an, a universal identifier to the transfer itself, but you'll see we've also assigned file level universal identifiers as well as checksums. Additionally, if you have your own checksums, you can bring those in and Archivematica will even check those for you. So not only does we, do we create checksums, but we have the ability to verify any of the checksums that you may have created before. Um, we can reformat metadata files, and you'll see here we're generating that transfer METS XML. Now it's important to note out no, to note right now that this METS XML is um, not the same METS that applies to your AIP. However, it is included in your AIP as transfer METS. So this is something um, where, if as an archivist you are especially concerned with original order, this is where you will find a lot of your original order information about your transfer. Now we skipped quarantine in this case, but that's something that you can enable using that administrative, administrative tab that I showed you earlier. Um, we've done our virus scan. If this microservice for virus scanning fails, not only will this line turn red, but all of the content will be booted out of the system because there has been a virus. Now, not all of the errors in Archivematica cause you to be booted from the system, but this one does. <laughs> um, other, other errors like a um, identification error, for instance, is something that you get to make a decision as an archivist or a librarian about whether that's something that's acceptable to you. It could be dependent upon whether the tool um, has been able to recognize a particular format, and that may or may not be that important to you given what kind of materials you are processing. So you'll see that we're at another decision point. There's that bell icon again. We're now being asked whether we would like to generate a transfer structure report. So. Um, if you were listening, I mentioned that the Mets XML contains our original order, and that's true. But we also have this other option that Harvard, Harvard Business School Library actually helped us fund. And this um, is the generation of a transfer structure report. It's just a text file, and that text file contains the directory structure of our transfer. So it's one other way to record that original order upon entry into Archivematica. In this case, I'm going to say, sure, yes, I would like to keep that. And then what happens is Archivematic keeps that um, as a log, and it's contained in the transfer, and eventually it ends up in your AIP as well. So now we are at the microservice called Identify File Format. Um, this is where you can choose right now two tools. You can choose between FIDO. FIDO uses pronoun identifiers. Uh, it's a tool that was developed by the Open Preservation Foundation, OPF. And then you can also choose to use file extension. You can add more tools to this using that FPR in the Preservation Planning tab. Again, we'll have a future webinar that goes into detail about that. Uh, you can also skip file identif identification right now entirely. Um, when you skip the file identification, you'll be given another choice during ingest, which is this other tab here, to choose a tool and move on from there. Um, in this case, I'm going to choose FIDO, and then when I'm given the choice in ingest, I'm going to say that I want to use the same information that I had from FIDO. So that's going to continue running. What's happening here during Identify File Format is it's calling to the Preservation Planning tab, calling to that FPR for rules. Um, you'll see the microservice extract packages. Normally, if we had any packages in our content, and that includes if we had digital forensic images, Archivematica would recognize that there were packages, and it would ask us, do you want to unpack those? And then if we chose to unpack them, it would also ask us if we wanted to keep the package or delete it. 
So you could, for instance, delete the zip file, but keep everything that you extracted from it, and then that's what you process in Archivematica. After extract package, packages, we run characterization and extraction of metadata. Sorry about that. <laughs> characterization and extraction of metadata um, predominantly runs a tool called FITS, which is File Information Toolset. It was created by Harvard. And the file information tool set runs multiple tools to do characterization and extraction of metadata. Um, thanks to the Museum of Modern Art, we have added several tools to this that do a slightly better job than FITS um, on audiovisual materials. If you want to know more detail about those tools and which ones we use, then I encourage you to go to the online demo later. But please look at our FPR. And if you hop over to our FPR and you look under characterization rules and commands, this is where you'll see all the different tools that we use, and you can drill down and you can see what we actually use those tools for. You'll see here also FiWalk. That is a new tool that we added for digital forensic image characterization and metadata extraction. Um, so you'll see after characterization extraction, we run validation. That's Jove. Now, some of you who are familiar with FITS might understand that Jove is included in FITS, but in this case, we've actually obscured it to do validation on its own. So now we're being asked whether we want to examine the contents. This is a microservice that we added as a result of our digital forensic workflow. I'm going to take a sip of water, one moment. So examine contents is running a tool called Bulk Extractor. Bulk Extractor is a digital forensics tool that runs a series of what it calls features. What that means is it outputs several text files that report on content like phone numbers, um, social security numbers, email addresses, and it's basically just reporting on where those are in the system. So I'm going to go ahead and choose to skip this, but if I'd wanted to run it, then I would have all of those bulk extractor logs. When we review it. Now I'm being asked if I am ready to go ahead and create a SIP. In this case, um, when I say create single SIP and continue processing, that means it's going to go straight into ingest. If I send it to a backlog, then that's going to allow me to either store it and come back to it later to do further processing, um, in particular normalization to preservation and access formats. Um, but it's also going to allow me to use the Archivematica um, arrange, SIP arrangement feature, which allows you to do a little bit of arrangement and some appraisal in the Archivematica dashboard. So I'm going to go ahead and send it the backlog. And now we've completed all the microservices during the transfer. And so I'm going to hop over to ingest. You'll see that it's still going, but it'll show up in ingest. It's going to the backlog right now. So now I'm in the ingest tab of the dashboard. In the ingest tab, Right here across the top, you see a search, and this is the search of the transfer backlog. Everything that's been sent to the backlog has been indexed, and so you'll see in this drop down here that you have a few specific things that you can highlight and search on. For instance, if you had assigned an accession number and you had multiple transfers that were associated with that accession number, you could search on that here and pull up all of your content that's associated with that particular accession number. Um, you can do a keyword or phrase search, and you can also add uh, multiple facets to this search. So in this case, um, I actually, I know the contents of my backlog, and I'm going to just do a very generic search, and I'm going to show you that when you do a search of the backlog, the search results show up in this panel over here that we're calling our originals pane. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So here in the originals panel is the results of this search, um, and in this case, this is everything in my transfer backlog. So here is what we started. You'll see now that the transfer we started before has a UUID attached to it. Um, these are all other transfers that have been run through Archivematica in the past. If you expand any of these, here's the one we just did, you'll see that each of them has three folders, logs, metadata, and objects. And you'll see that logs and metadata will always be grayed out. And the reason they're grayed out is because you can't make any changes to those logs and metadata because those, again, they have information about your original order, they have information about the services that have already run in Archivematica, and you would not want to tamper with those. If you expand objects, however, you'll see that you have all of your digital content objects listed here, 
And if you have a viewer in your browser that allows you to view any of these, you can actually highlight it with the red box, click on view file, and then in the other tab, you'll actually see your digital content. Now, another interesting thing is despite the fact that your logs and your metadata are grayed out, you can also do the same thing with those. So you'll see here that we have our file format identification log that is a result of having run FIDO. If I select that and I choose view file, then this will open another tab as well and you can actually go through the entire log from your format identification. Um, so this does allow you to review other things, you just can't make any changes again to those logs or metadata. So the purpose of this workflow is, um, as you might have seen over here, this is our SIP arrangement. So if you want to do a combination of multiple transfers into one SIP, um, or if you want to take one transfer and break it apart into multiple SIPs, then you can do that here. Um, you can also name your directories. So if I choose add directory over here, I can enter a new directory. I'm going to call this, this is going to be a series. Click OK. And so now you'll see that in addition to two other processing um, folders that I added earlier in other demos, we've also got webinar series that I just added. I could add other directories underneath this if I wanted to, as deep as I need to go um, to structure this SIP. Um, and then if I want to add content to it, I can either pull an entire directory. So for instance, here is a transfer I did before. I'm going to pull the whole objects directory over into this new SIP. And then if I expand it, you'll see that they've all been moved over. Um, and then I can also just move one at a time. So if there's just one object, in this new transfer that I've just added that you saw me process, then I can grab that and I can move that over as well. And so now I've created a new SIP and what's happened concurrently is that all of the logs and metadata have also been moved along with the content from each of these transfers. And so that means that even if you take just one object from a folder, you're also getting all of the logs and all of the metadata. So then if I'm ready to create a SIP, I highlight it here with that red box again, click Create SIP, accept it, and it's going to go ahead and show up in the ingest workflow and tell me that yes, it's been successfully created. So now if I scroll down, I see that here is my new SIP, I can approve it, and I can go through processing in Archivematica. You can also see that other contents um, other transfers are ready for decisions. I have some transfers that are ready for storage. I have some transfers that are ready for normalization. And I'm going to take this one through the entire process so you see everything that occurs. OK. So um, first, before I do normalization, I'm going to show you our template that allows you to add simple Dublin core and our template that allows you to add premise rights and restrictions. So our metadata template, if you click add, you'll see here our simple Dublin core. Um, this part of AIC relates to a research data and um, multiple part AIP or AIP versioning workflow. And we will have a future webinar that goes into that, but otherwise, this is all simple Dublin Core that you can add to your content, and this applies to the level of the package, so not to the individual files. So you can add metadata there, and you can also add under rights, premise, rights, and restrictions. Um, there are multiple bases, copyright, statute, license, donor policy, and other. And for each of those bases, you have a second page where you can add um, acts, and you can have multiple acts per bases, and you can have multiple bases. Acts would be things like dissemination, migration, etc. And then your grantor restriction is either allow, disallow, and we've added conditional, which not, is not explicit in premise, but we've added it to allow for something like a note that says a form needs to be filled out in the reading room. All right, I'm going to go back to ingest now. Um, so assuming you've added all the metadata that you want to add, you're ready for normalization. At this stage, you get to make some choices about whether you want to normalize your content for preservation and access. So that means 
making preservation copies that go in your AIP alongside your originals, and making access copies that go in your dissemination information package and then are sent to whatever access system you're using. Um, you can normalize just for preservation. Uh, you can reject out, right, for whatever reason here. And then there's some other options that we go into in detail in our documentation. So please do, if you're curious, go and look at those. I want to point out one in particular, normalize manually. This is if Archivematica does not have tools um, that you might have locally. For instance, if you have a proprietary tool that does a really great job that you're happy with in uh, normalizing Office documents to PDF, for instance, then you can normalize those manually here at this stage in the process. I'm going to choose to let Archivematica do all of the normalization for preservation and access. And so now what's happening is that Archivematica microservice normalize is calling up um, that FPR in the preservation planning tab and running a number of services. Based on rules that we have there. So you'll see that all of these jobs are happening during normalization. Um, you'll remember that I pre-selected that um, Archivematica would use the same results of the format identification that we did in transfer. So it has done that and it's seen that format original and based on what that original is, it pulls a particular tool and runs a particular command to do a transformation into your preservation and access formats. So while this is running, um, this can be one of the longer microservices depending on how much you have um, in your content. And uh, it can also be reviewed as soon as it's complete. So there are two ways to re review the results of your normalization. One is to look at a report here. So when I click on that, it opens in a new tab. If there had been any errors, you'd see those errors at the top. And if you drilled down into the link behind any of the errors, you would see exactly what had happened. Um, and you'd have a better understanding of what that error might have been. But you'll see here you have your file name and you have the format of that file and whether normalization uh, was attempted and succeeded and whether access normalization was attempted and succeeded. Another way that you can review the results of normalization are by clicking on review here next to review normalization normalization and if you drill down into the content in preservation and access um, you'll see this is our webinar series it's got its UUID attached to it the access copies will be in a folder called dip so here you'll see all of our access copies that have been prepended by their individual file UUID and you'll see that access copies are things like mp3s and jpegs so smaller files than what might be in our objects in our preservation objects so let's just look at our preservation objects here, and you'll see these can be much larger files. We've got our original here is in um, MPEG, and it's been made into an MKV, and again, it's got its UUID now appended to its file name. So again, big team short, this is our original, and here is our wave copy that we've made for our preservation format. So, <clears throat> and you can also, in the same way that during SIP arrangement, you can click on these, and if you have a viewer available in your web browser, you can view or review any of these. So if it all looks good to you, then you approve the results of your normalization. Oops, sorry about that. And then once you approve, what Archivematica is going to do is prepare your content um, to be made into your AIP for storage and your DIP for upload to an access system. Now you'll see here after normalize, there's a microservice that we skipped called transcribe SIP contents. And this allows you to do very basic transcription that's um, right now limited to OCR, but that's also dominated and um, run by the format policy registry. So we'd like to add other forms of transcription to that over time. And you would be able to benefit from those as soon as you updated your FPR using that update button that I showed you. So you'll see that um, now we're ready to upload our DIP. Um, so we can either upload that, that those access copies and a copy of the same METS XML that is in the AIP to an access system, or we can also choose to just download that DIP to somewhere locally that we've chosen. Um, in this case, I'm going to download it, but first I want to show you the store AIP choice. Um, our AIP has been prepared. Um, we only have one location here, but you can have multiple locations to send your AIP to, and we're just going to choose this one, but there could be multiple in that dropdown. They would be configured using your storage service as well. 
and then I'm going to go on back down here to the upload dip and you'll see that I can upload to I've got options to upload to archivist toolkit upload to content DM and then there's that upload dip to Atom, which is access to memory again. Um, we're not currently attached to anything, to another system. So in this case, I'm going to choose to store that dip. And then it's going to ask me the same question as it did for the AIP about where I would like to store that dip. And those locations are also configured using the Archivematica storage service. And you can have more than one place, and they would all show up for you. So we just have our one here. So now you'll see that our microservice store AIP has completed successfully. So that means that our AIP has stored. So now I'm going to show you our archival storage search. Here in this archival storage tab, um, all of our AIPs have been indexed using a tool called Elasticsearch. It's, the, it's most of the METS XML that has been indexed. And it's searchable. This should look a lot, this should look very familiar to you um, because it looks a lot like the transfer backlog search. Slightly different here in some of our specific choices in the drop down, including again that AIC workflow that I briefly mentioned earlier, um, and that we will have a follow up webinar about later this year. But something like you can search on the AIP UUID, or if you know that you're looking for all of the AIPs that have a particular file extension, you can do that. Um, and you can search for, again, multiple facets, um, keyword or phrase. And you can also you can choose whether to show entire AIPs, which is what you're seeing in this list here, or to show files. So if I click on show files and do a search, you'll see that I'm actually seeing individual files, but I'm also seeing the AIPs that they're associated with. And some of them actually have thumbnails because there are rules in the FPR for creating thumbnails that you can access in this archival storage tab. And you can download any of these from here. If you do a search for an entire AIP, you can also download your AIP from here. So that is Archivematica in a nutshell. Um, I've skipped a lot of our workflows, and this was the very basic workflow. Um, just quickly, I'll show you that we have in this transfer type. So again, we're back at that original tab. In transfer type, we have multiple different kinds of transfers. Um, so we weren't able to go through any of those workflows. We have um, unzipped and zipped bag ingest workflows. Those refer to um, contents that are bagged using the Library of Congress bag it specification. We have our, again, DSpace transfers, which is what I mentioned um, when I was talking about some of the integrations that we've done. And then disk image refers to our forensic disk imaging workflow. And we will have an entire webinar devoted to that later this year as well, because it's a slightly different workflow. Um, and it's, it's useful to talk with the community about that. And I imagine people on that call would probably have a lot of questions, especially if they're using um, digital forensic tools outside of Archivematica, like BitCurator which is a project that does digital forensics for archivists and specifically. So look for that later this year. Um, so now it's time for me to um, take a breath and take questions. So if you have any questions, please do let us know um, by asking a question in your chat. And I we will take
Okay, not a lot of questions today, so thank you. Please get in touch via the discussion list, and we'll answer anything that you have in the future. Take care. Thank you.